What happened that morning turned the war again. The members of the 507th had been on the move with little sleep for two and a half days. Suddenly, they were on the wrong road at the wrong time and at the wrong end of Iraqi guns. They had a spot set up right there, just unloading on anything that turned at the corner. Machine gun fire? Yes. Small weapons fire? Yeah. Edgar Hernandez and Shauna Johnson were in a five-ton tractor trailer, followed by Miller and Riley, then Joe Hudson in his 10-ton wrecker. Moving up the convoy was the Humvee carrying Jessica Lynch and four other soldiers. What did you see as they passed you? Machine gun fire. There was people firing at the Humvee, and there was everywhere you looked, somebody was firing. And were they firing from out of the Humvee? There was return fire from the Humvee. And they just dis dis disappeared in the distance. Up ahead, specialists Hernandez and Johnson had their own problems. At the wheel of the huge rig, Hernandez was ducking beneath the dashboard to dodge incoming fire. As he tried to maneuver around an Iraqi dump truck blocking their way, he veered off the road. I got stuck in the mud. A jackknife. The trailer portion was, was it still on the road? Part of it, the end part, part of it. it. And at the same time, we're getting hit from every direction. At that point, my weapon was working. I was able to fire off a shot. I saw some money in the train line, and I tried to uh, take him out. And all of a sudden, somebody hit us from behind, and the whole truck moved. I turned back, and then I saw the Humvee. The speeding Humvee had slammed into the back of their jackknifed tractor trailer. Did you feel the impact, Shauna? Yes. They hit the truck moving pretty fast. Yes. yes. We jumped when it hit it. I felt it more than I heard it. And we, didn't, we weren't sure what it was until uh, Hernandez took a look back and saw what it was. Did you know who was in that vehicle? Yes. I knew uh, Lori was driving first time. I knew Lynch was in the vehicle. I didn't know anybody else. Private first class Lori Piestoa was driving the Humvee when she lost control after an explosion. In the back seat, her best friend in the unit Jessica Lynch. But there was uh, no movement whatsoever. Do you remember what you thought when you saw that? Uh, heartbreak. Because there was, you just knew that they were all gone. But we had to keep going. Captain King, with five of his soldiers, made it through the gauntlet of Iraqis and raced out of town to find help. The Marines they had passed going into An Nazaria were still there. They immediately made their way up the highway and rescued 10 members of the 507th who were stranded near their disabled vehicles and under fire. But the Marines could not rescue all of them. At this point, I probably had four of my eight tires shot out by that time. So there's smoke just flying everywhere, rubber flying everywhere. Enemy fire brought Joe Hudson's wrecker to a halt and killed the soldier sitting next to him, Chief Warrant Officer Johnny Mata. Hudson, himself wounded, was surrounded. They stopped firing and they came to the truck, opened the door and pulled me out. And what did they do with you? They threw me in the back of a truck and went to, went to the Anasar headquarters. Parading him like a trophy, he says, along the way. At the rear of the convoy, James Riley and Patrick Miller were taking some of the heaviest fire. The truck was getting hit. I was ducking up under the dash and popping up just to make sure I was still on the road. I could see the bullets bouncing off the, off the hood. And the sounds, what did you hear? Just pop, 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 pop. Just rounds rattling off the metal. And I seen one guy jump out in the road and aim at me, and I ended up hitting him. Miller says at this point, the truck's transmission had been shot out. And just steadily losing speed. So you were basically coasting to a stop? Pretty much. Even as you took fire? Yes. Uh, we got out on foot. He's in front of me. And he runs a lot faster than me. You know? Getting shot out will make you run faster. And he takes off, and I'm right behind him, going as fast as I can, trying to get to cover. Were they shooting at you oh, yeah. as you moved down that road? Oh, yeah. You could hear the bullets swinging by your head and impacting on the concrete around us. How'd you ever make it down there alive? I have no idea. I have no idea, sir. None. Luck. Blind luck. On foot, under fire, Riley and Miller ran nearly a quarter of a mile to reach Edgar Hernandez and Shauna Johnson 
whose vehicle had been rammed by the Humvee. The back end of the tractor trailer was right up to the front windshield. Uh, you have the butt end of the trailer, and here's the front windshield. And I looked in to see if anybody was alive. And from my perspective, the only thing I saw was uh, Lynch's foot twitching. But she looked like she'd been, she was dead like everybody else in the truck. Didn't appear anybody had survived, no, as best you could see. The, the twitching, I, I assumed, was from the after effects of the nerves. So I ran. That was the only movement inside the, yes. the vehicle. Believing no one in the Humvee had survived, Pat Miller risked his own life, setting out to commandeer a nearby Iraqi truck. Sergeant Riley tried to provide cover fire, but there was a problem. At this point, the weapons are jamming up. They're not. We're having some, experiencing some, some malfunctions. Shauna, that's when you were hit. What do you remember about that? Sergeant Riley had told us to get down, take cover, and then I felt the burn. The burn of the, of the bullets going through your My legs. Leg. Edgar, at what, at what point were you injured? Like 30 seconds later. Already hit by shrapnel in the face, Hernandez, on the ground beneath his truck, took a bullet in his right arm. So you're injured, you are injured, and at this point, James, all three of you are under the truck, trying to take cover as best you trying can. Trying to take cover and taking fire from RPGs, um, which are rocket propelled grenades. Some, I don't know what they were, an improvised explosive of some sort, uh, like a great big pipe bomb, because you could hear it hit the uh, asphalt and go ding, ding, boom, as it blew up. Are you talking about a major assault on you? Oh, yeah. We could see them moving around trying to just wait. And there were more of them coming every second. Unable to reach that Iraqi truck, Private Miller instead scrambled to a spot overlooking the road. What he did there may have saved his fellow soldiers' lives. It earned him a silver star. I seen a group of Iraqis setting up a mortar pit. And as one of them tried to load the round into the tube, I shot him and he fell over and dropped the round. They did that about like six more times. Never got the round loaded. You were picking them off every time they, they tried to drop one in? Yes. One after the other? Yes. There was a guy running with an AK-47, had uh, two women in front of him, using him as like a human shield. So I popped the round off over in that direction, and they all fell down. The two women got up, I guess, got away from the guy. And when the guy got up again, I shot off another round, and he just fell over. And then as I looked back toward the uh, mortar pit, all I saw was a big circle. and. That's when I had to give up because there was nothing else I can do. A circle of Iraqis around you. Yes. If I wouldn't give up, I'd probably be dead. And what happened at that point? They like gang tackled me. For the 507th, the fight was almost over. Sergeant Riley made a decision that frustrates him to this day. None of the weapons were functioning. I've got two wounded. Uh, Miller's already been surrounded and captured, and they've got us totally and pretty much encircled and pouring fire in, so the choice was taken away. It, that's part of the code of conduct. You, you resist until you no longer have the means to resist, and at that point we didn't have the means to resist. It was a choice of die now or die later. So what did you do? Hope like hell they wouldn't shoot me when I walked out and crawled out and put the weapon down and put my hands up. They pulled you out from under the truck, Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that? Terror. You don't know what's going to happen. James, how scared were you? Oh, it, it, that hadn't hit, it, hit yet. That didn't have hit until later. It was more of uh, being pissed off, sir. Pissed off at? The, 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 the firefight not being able to uh, send a couple of them to meet their maker. It would have been really nice to send a couple of them to somewhere else. 
It had been a costly day for the lost convoy. Eleven dead, many wounded. The running gun battle had lasted about an hour, an eternity in combat. These five survived, but now in captivity, the test of their courage would continue. You know, they have a camera on your face after all this happened. What's your name? Shauna. Shauna? Angry, scared, and in a tremendous amount of pain. You come from Texas? Yes. The cameras were rolling as the five POWs get their first taste of life at the hands of the Iraqis. And I'm sitting in my own pool of blood. I was pissed off. When ambush continues. A Stone Phillips exclusive continues on Dateline. Eleven of their comrades lay dead, casualties of the firefight in An-Nazarene. Now, now, the machinist, the mechanic, the welder, the officials. Yes, I thought they were going to shoot me dead right there on the spot. The whole time you're sitting there wondering if they're going to kill you. Is that, is that option? Edgar, how about you? I did wonder if I was going to die. But the soldier with the most cause for concern may have been Private Frost, Patrick Miller. Did you worry that because you had obviously inflicted casualties, that maybe they were going to seek retribution against you? Yes. You come to kill, to kill Iraqi people? No, I come to fix broke stuff. And I, I told to shoot only if I'm shot at. And they shot at me first, so I shoot back. I don't, I don't want to kill anybody. But in protecting his comrades by shooting those Iraqis in that mortar pit, he had. How many do you think you killed? Total or just in the pit? Just in that pit. Uh, there were seven in that pit. From any unit in army? Oh, 507th Maintenance Company. Within hours of their capture, the Americans were questioned in front of Iraqi TV cameras. The world saw their faces, but could only imagine what the POWs themselves were seeing. Tell me about the videotaping. What was the scene behind the camera? It was, it was haywire. I mean, there's 15 people trying to ask you the same question. What's your name? What's your name? Sergeant James Riley. Bunch of people with uh, weapons. Bunch of people outside the door with weapons. Didn't have my glasses, so it was limited visibility for me. Were you scared? Oh, yeah. Are they going to do a public execution? Is it going to be torture? What's the purpose of this? Where, where is this going? What was going through your mind, Joe? I was upset. I was really irate. That was um, your response, anger. That was my response. I was very angry. They put that camera in front of my face, and all I could think about, name, rank, social, and stare, stare dead straight in that camera. What's your name? Specialist Joseph Hudson, 585-65. I mean, I'm sitting in my own pool of blood. And that's all I could think of. I was just, I was pissed off. What's your name? I was laying down on a, like on a couch. And I felt so weak, so tired, because I had lost a lot of blood. And when they came in, then they asked me questions, they picked me up. My name, my name is Edgar from the United States. And I was in so much pain. And I wasn't really thinking at that time. Almost as if you were someplace else. Yes. Disturbing as it was to see wounded Americans paraded for Iraqi cameras, it was the image of a female POW that made America gasp. Shana, where are do you come from? Texas. Once they figured out I was a female, they uh, immediately separated me from the males. Right there on the scene. I was taken somewhere else. What did they do with you? They bandaged my wounds. Fairly soon after all of this happened? Yes. And then taken for the interrogation, the television the interview, tele if you will. Yes. And they uh, made it fairly obvious that they had bandaged my leg, I guess, to make it seem that they had given some medical care. 
You were looking back and forth. Because the person holding the microphone was not the person that was speaking English. So I just looked back and forth between them. From any unit? Of... From any unit in uh, American Army. 507th maintenance. The parents yes. said they thought you looked very frightened. I was. It's the unknown. You don't know what's going to happen to you. I was in a lot of pain. And I was angry too. When the cameras stopped rolling, all five prisoners were piled into a Toyota 4Runner. Destination, Baghdad. That's when I was first scared was that time when they were transporting us. We didn't know what to expect. Two more POWs, these American helicopter pilots, joined them in Baghdad. It was in the Iraqi capital that the wounded prisoners received much needed medical care. Beneath the field dressings on Shauna Johnson's legs were bullet wounds that required immediate attention. They did what they could for me. They even performed a surgery. The damage was pretty bad. If they hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. So were you taken to a hospital? Yes. They spoke English? Doctors? One doctor spoke English. Did you trust him? It's kind of... Did I have a choice? I really didn't have a choice. I knew the damage to my leg. I knew that I could get an infection and just and die. I didn't know when I was going to be rescued, if I was going to be rescued. I just had to take my chance. And I leaned on Joe a little bit. He, uh... Yes, I, I made the doctor show me his credentials before he even touched me. You asked to see his... I asked to see paperwork saying that he is a doctor. His diploma, his medical yes. degree. And he, and he was, showed it to you? He showed yes. it to me. He was trained by British doctors. And you were satisfied with I what you saw? I was very satisfied. Uh -huh. They removed two pieces of shrapnel from my lower right ribs and one round from my lower, my lower left back. Is it true that they actually had you sign a release? Yes. yes. They made us, like, um, mine was like, you know, I understand I'm going to have surgery for removal of shrapnel wounds. And I will be under general anesthesia. anesthesia. Sign, name, right. <laughs> You're prisoners of war, and they're and they're asking for a medical release form. Yes. Yeah. Over the next three weeks, the POW say they were blindfolded and moved seven times. Once driven right through the middle of a firefight in Baghdad, there were more interrogations by what appeared to be high-ranking Iraqi officers, but mostly the prisoners spent time in their rooms, held separately in secret locations. Tell me a little bit about what the days in captivity were like. Real lonely and real quiet. And their meals, real small and very predictable. Chicken and rice. Chicken and rice. Boiled chicken with no flavor and plain white rice. <laughs> the cook in the outfit. Of <laughs> Uniform of the day, slippers and striped pajamas. Tops and that's what we wore on the bottoms. These were your prison stripes? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dateline has been told that in the first hours of captivity, several of the POWs were beaten with rifle butts, slapped, kicked, and humiliated. But when Private Miller began describing what happened to him right after he surrendered... They walked me back down the road, and some Iraqi came and uh, punched me in the mouth. The group cautioned him to go no further. Can't go there. Mm -hmm. Don't go there. Let me just say this for the viewers. The issue of physical abuse is still under investigation by the Army. You have been instructed not to talk about that? Yes. Correct, sir. But the POWs told us that generally their treatment was humane. If anything, they say, they were the ones tormenting their captors in any little way they could. I pulled a whistling spree a couple times, and they would get a little irate and tell me, you know, to shut up. <laughs> they didn't like your whistling? They didn't like whistling at all. So it was a form of making noise and communicating, they knew it. While Hudson whistled, Miller warbled. Yeah. His song had a message. The one that I was singing all the time just to make him mad. What were, what were you singing? I was singing uh, Toby Keith's uh, Angry American. And how's that go? Apparently, Miller's version was a little harder on the ear. 
He can't sing. He can't sing. <laughs> you were hurting your captors and you were hurting these guys. He can't yeah, so sing at so. all. It was, oh my goodness. <laughs> that must be really hurting them because it's hurting us. Yes. <laughs> By April 1st, the Americans had been prisoners for 10 days. Back home, their capture and the calamity at An Nazaria had sparked debate about whether the U.S. military strategy had put units like the 507th unnecessarily at risk. The Pentagon was taking heat when suddenly it had some astonishingly good news about a soldier from the 507th. Coalition forces have conducted a successful rescue mission of a U.S. Army prisoner of war held captive in Iraq. Private Jessica Lynch had survived that devastating Humvee accident, and a special forces operation had plucked her from behind enemy lines in An Nazaria. Welcome back. There, there you go. Doing? You're so doing glad great, Jessica. You're doing Private great. Lynch's rescue was cause for celebration. Okay. But where Bye. were her comrades in arms, the other members of the 507th? last seen by their families on those Iraqi videotapes. Were they even still alive? The military had no answers. What was the most frightening part of captivity for you? It was frightening and also hopeful to hear the U.S. coming. We could hear them coming. The bombs? The bombs, we could hear artillery, we could hear them coming. So that gives you hope because you think they're gonna come and get us. But it's also scary, because what if the bomb hits us? Were they close? Very, very Building shaking, bricks falling out of, the, out of the walls. Roof peeling back. So you're wondering, after all of this, what if we're taken out by one of our own bombs? Yes. Sean, we spoke to your parents a couple of days after you were taken prisoner of war. Your mom said she hoped you had your rosary with you. Did you? No, I didn't. But you prayed a lot. Oh, yes. I knew my daughter would be taken care of. My, parent, my parents would take care of my daughter. I wasn't worried about that at all. I was worried about how my parents, my family, my humongous family, <laughs> was going to deal with my captivity. And I prayed. Prayed for them? Prayed for them to have peace of mind if I didn't make it out. You know, but, uh, I figured I'd made it through that far. God had a plan. For these POWs, a band of angels was on the way, bearing a striking resemblance to U.S. Marines. When we come back, the POWs rescue. The stunning news of another rescue. We're like, what? Uh, and they were like, well, I think her name is Lynch. And we're like, Lynch is alive? The Sweet Taste of Liberty, when Ambush Continues. The story of the 507, a Stone Phillips exclusive. Fort Bliss, Texas, Friday, April 11th. A memorial service to honor the soldiers of the 507 killed at An Nazaria saying goodbye to nine of their own. By now, three weeks into the war, victory in Iraq seemed all but certain. Baghdad had fallen. Jessica Lynch had been rescued. And yet the fate of the remaining POWs was still unknown. But the somber spirits at this army post were about to get a huge lift, courtesy of the United States Marines. beautiful. I was so happy when I heard them, when I heard them yelling uh, clear English, you know. I knew that they were Americans. What did they say, do you remember? Get down. Everybody down. get down. And all of us were on the floor. <laughs> well, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, well, she's an American. Well, she's still got to get down. Because of your leg? You yeah, get down? I, I couldn't get down fast enough. <laughs> Acting on a tip from an Iraqi, the Marines had stormed the building in a town north of Baghdad. By then, the POWs had all been herded into one room. We we're so happy to see them. And they took a chance. It could have been an ambush, they could have been set up. They took a chance, took a chance with their own lives to bring us home. And uh, I'm grateful that our captors didn't fight. 
They didn't put up any resistance? No, no resistance. Because no that could have been disastrous. Been it was a beautiful thing, sir. Had you ever been so glad to see a Marine? <laughs> <laughs> That was Joe's words right it. there. <laughs> that was your words? That's my words. words. And those are big words for, a, for oh, an yes. Army man. Yes. <laughs> like, like I told him, I never talk any smack about another Marine again. So you were let out from your single room, and where'd you go? Hopped in the back of a light armored vehicle. vehicle. All those piled in, sitting on MRE, MRE boxes, bottled water, crammed together. I'm, <laughs> I'm shoved in Shauna's lap, and everybody's... everybody's <laughs> crowded like crazy and started moving and that's when we knew it was for real we're, we're out of here they pulled us out and i'm bawling <laughs> tears of joy yes tears of joy. and a young man coming up to me ma'am united states marine corps i'm taking you home and i turned around and looked at him he was so young and through my tears i remember saying that you're so young he was like it's okay i'm going home i love you marines i love you marines one of the first things the rescued POWs heard from the Marines was the news about their comrade, Jessica Lynch, whom they hadn't seen since the ambush. The Marines told us, you know, they rescued that other female. We're like, what? Uh, and they were like, well, I think her name is Lynch. We're like, Lynch is alive? Oh my, my goodness, we couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. Evacuated to Kuwait, it was there they made their first calls home to friends and family. I called my wife and what I expected was, you know, five minutes of nothing but crying from both of us trying to get a word in. And, but it was me that was crying and I was very amazed at my wife's strength. She, she was very strong through the whole ordeal and never gave up hope. Dad? Shauna, how are you? I'm okay. Well, it seems everybody heard my first phone call, huh? Uh, I wonder how that happened. <laughs> uh, On Dateline. Yes. <laughs> We saw the picture. You look good. But you just gotta remember me. Yeah, hey, y'all. Shut are you worrying about your hair? Well, I wanna say for the record, your hair, <laughs> Shauna Johnson, looks again. just beautiful. <laughs> I need to get it done. <laughs> your mom says when she heard that from you over the telephone, she knew you were okay. She knows me pretty well. <laughs> if that's what you were worried about. Yeah, I was. I was okay. I was alive. We had found out Lynch was alive. We had found out that some of the others had made it out. You know, it was a lot to be grateful for. Hold on, I got a little voice for you. That's mommy. Hello, mommy. Hey, mommy. Hello, mommy. Hi, what was it like to hear your daughter's voice over the phone? It was great. She let me know that I had a couple owies. I was like, yeah, mommy's got owies. <laughs> <laughs> Captured on a Sunday, rescued on a Sunday, and home to Fort Bliss in time for Easter Sunday. Pat, you holding the flag. Joe, you pumping your fist. Pumping my fist. What was that moment like for the two of you? It was beautiful. I mean, we popped, popped out of the hatch. You know, and I said, hey, Miller, Miller, hold the flag. And hey, I'm waving at the crowd. And, First thing we saw was like, wow, that is a big flag. For a kid from Kansas, it's a lot of attention, isn't it? Yes, it's overwhelming. All the attention that you get, it's just nice to be back home. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your outstanding support. This means the world to all of us. Remember our fallen soldiers. God bless America. This is why we live in a great country. When we come back, five newly decorated soldiers on what it took to make it home. Lessons learned the hard way. The Army's not that bad. Only when you go to war. <laughs> when ambush continues. I can't believe she's eating that. Skinny people love to eat that in public. Eat your cheese. Yeah. In fact, I have a family waiting for me at home. And it's like my daughter's not grow up fatherless. It's the only thing that kept me going. Edgar, how about you? Um, you're back, you're married, yes. and you've re-upped. I did. 
Um, this didn't give you second thoughts? No, like, I don't know, the army is not that bad. Only when you go to war. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you go to war. And what did you learn about yourself? I have a strong will to survive. You can endure. You never know what you can do until you're put to the test. I never would have dreamed that I would have been able to make, make it through all of this. I got plenty of help, though. From these guys? Yeah. Left and right? We have five diverse people. We got Panamanian. We got East Coast. We got Kansas. We got a Hispanic. And me, I'm half Filipino. It's a portrait of America. Yes. We have five diverse groups of people that came together and came together good. In July, under a bright Texas sky, the Army honored newly returned veterans from the war in Iraq. Among them, five former POWs, members of a maintenance company recognized for valor in combat. For Patrick Miller, the Silver Star, bronze for the others, all five decorated with Prisoner of War medals and Purple Hearts. Just as their names were called on this honor roll, the soldiers whose story you heard tonight wanted us to call and you to remember the names on another honor roll, the members of that ill-fated convoy who died in a place called An Nazaria. Specialist Jamal Addison, Sergeant Edward Anguiano, Sergeant George Bugs, First Sergeant Robert Dowdy, Private Ruben Estrella Soto, Private First Class Howard Johnson, Specialist James Keel, Chief Warrant Officer Johnny Mata, Private First Class Lori Piestoa, Private Brandon Sloan, Sergeant Donald Walters. I am proud to have served with the ones that lost their lives that day. I'm a better person for having known them. A few final notes. An Army investigation concluded that the navigational error that led to the tragedy in An Nazaria was caused by a combination of factors. Operational pace, acute fatigue, isolation, and the harsh environmental conditions. But assigned no blame, no disciplinary action recommended. The former POWs told us their mental and physical adjustment to life back here at home is progressing. Although Shauna Johnson and Edgar Hernandez say their wounds have been slow to heal. They all say thanks for the overwhelming support they've received. That's all for this edition of Dateline Friday. We'll see you again for Dateline Sunday at 7, 6 central. I'm Stone Phillips and for all of us at NBC News, good night.